Uh, thank you, Marty. And just want to give another huge congratulations to the class of 2023. So cool, you guys all made it. Uh, some of you just earned another row on your LinkedIn profiles. <laughs> awesome. Uh, some of the folks behind me just earned the eternal right to insist that everyone in their lives refer to them as doctor. <laughs> um, but that's why you all are here, uh, and I totally, I get that. I don't really know why I'm here. <laughs> uh, it's true that I was sitting where all of you were sitting about 15 years ago. I graduated from the MIMS program. And it's also true that I still pedal in and ponder information professionally and for fun. Um, so it's possible that I'm here to tell you about one potential direction that you all can take from this point forward. Or maybe as one of the few people on earth who has spent literally over a decade working on an iSchool final project, <laughs> I'm here as some kind of cautionary tale. Uh, you know, don't, don't be this guy. Uh, he didn't really understand what graduation meant. He didn't, he didn't realize that you could stop and, and do anything else. Um, I'm a little alarmed to entertain the thought that I'm here to give you all advice of some kind. If, if you are anything like the people that I went to the School of Information with, um, you're all smarter than I am. Uh, and you've spent the last few years hanging around professors and researchers and your fellow students, all of whom are really among some of the brightest lights in the world. I've spent the last 15 years desperately searching through Stack Overflow, trying to find like the right answer. Um, so I've made a few poor choices and maybe you all should giving, be giving me advice. So I'm not, I'm not gonna give you much advice here, nor am I really gonna try and inspire you or convince you that working with information is still worth it, despite you know, the looming demise of democracy and the entrenchment of capital and the myriad misuses of literally every good idea technologists have ever come up with. Um, I'm just gonna tell you about a few events from my life with information, mostly with, related to iNaturalist. Uh, that's, really, that's really all I feel I have to give you. I hope they strike a chord with what you've learned over the last few years and some of the great work that you're all about to do in the world. And if you find yourself inspired, I assure you it will be by accident. <laughs> all right, so if there isn't a particularly descriptive blurb in your program or if Marty's introduction was, didn't quite uh, paint a picture for you, um, actually, I, John was just telling me that all of you were forced to use iNaturalist in one of your classes, so. <laughs> Uh, you all know what it's about, but your parents don't. So um, just a little thumbnail, iNaturalist is a website, an app where you uh, upload your pictures of organisms you see in nature. So if you see, you go on a hike and you see a cool newt on the trail, you can upload that to the internet and other people on the internet can see what you posted and they can tell you what kind of newt it was and they can, you can talk to them about, you know, what's the life of a newt like? Um, so the next time you're on a trail, you can impress your friends and family by saying, you know, that's not just a newt, that's a California newt. <laughs> and if you eat it, it will kill you. Um, <laughs> bonus, every time you do that, you're recording useful information, right? So you're taking a picture, you're recording this what, where, and when uh, about biodiversity, and that's enormously beneficial to scientists and conservationists who really need that information to do their work. Um, it's actually... That kind of information is pretty, pretty rare. Or information about where organisms are is pretty rare, like unless that organism is Rihanna or Elon or something. <laughs> um, anyway, that's the thumbnail. I, that was my final project. I'm still working on it. Um, and all of my stories kind of revolve around it. So uh, those of you who were forced to use it, if you had a bad time, sorry. Um, so my first story begins in 2010. It was two years after I'd graduated and I was mostly keeping INET going on my own, and this guy gave a talk here at Cal over across campus at Mulford Hall, and his name was Scott Laurie, and he's an, he was an ecologist, and he just had uh, just published a paper in Nature, kind of a big deal, um, and it was about how quickly climate change will shift environmental envelopes, you know, like where is the like, average 70 degree band on the Earth gonna, gonna move to given climate change? And whether or not the organisms that need those climatic conditions, maybe you need it hot, maybe you need it cold, um, whether they can move quickly enough to keep up with those shifting envelopes. Um, so to study this problem, Scott needed information, like all good scientists. And for the climate stuff, he had satellites, right? Satellites are these information gathering and producing marvels, and it was so much data about climate 
about you know, how hot and how much rain and how much ice. Uh, so he did a really good job of, of, of thinking about where those um, envelopes were going to be. But the other side of it, where the organisms were, that was kind of missing. Um, Satellites can tell you about trees, and they can tell you about elephants, and these days they could tell you about really slow-moving squirrels. Um, but they can't really tell you about that newt under a log or that bee on a flower. For that, you really still need people on the ground looking at these things and recording, these recording the data manually. And if you want to get that kind of data, you need to go, again, across campus over to MVZ and look in their drawers and drawers of jars of dead things. That's how we database this kind of information. And that's just limited by how many drawers you can stuff dead things into. Um, which is a long way of saying that basically there's not a lot of that kind of data. And every time Scott would give a talk about his research, he would end by saying, you know what we need? We need this giant group of people with their smartphones taking pictures of organisms so that we can have this giant database that's going to rival all the satellites. And someone that I knew was in the crowd and was like, are you, are you talking about iNaturalist? Is, is that what you're talking about? So Scott and I got in touch, and um, my first impression of him was, wow, this guy talks way too much. <laughs> uh, Scott had a lot of big ideas and big plans about what he wanted to do with INAT, and he really wanted to tell me about them, like, a lot, and I really didn't care, because that's just not how I think. It's not how I learn, that kind of, like, verbal barrage. Um, I like to read, I like to consider, sometimes I like to write my thoughts down, but that kind of verbal excess is not my preferred uh, way to consume information, it's not really what I like, and despite present circumstances aside, it's not generally how I like to communicate information, um, so apologies to those of you who are like me. Uh, so I was kind of like, whatever, this guy's full of it, not unlike several other people with big ideas and big plans for INAT who had approached me in the two years since leaving the iSchool. But I'd found that I had a really good mechanism for testing folks out, which was, did they actually upload any observations to INET? Because <laughs> if they didn't, that means they didn't you know, jump that lowest hurdle. They didn't even sign up for an account. They didn't even try to use this thing that they were trying to exploit. Um, so you know, I had this, this talk with Scott, and I was like, eh, whatever. He's not, he's not really into this. But I'll just check out and see like, whether he signed up. And he definitely signed up. He'd signed up, and he'd added 60-plus observations. And they weren't just observations of his spouse and his dog, which is what pretty much everyone uploads uh, for the first time. Uh, he'd, he'd posted an unusual local toad, uh, a colobus monkey from fieldwork he'd done in Tanzania, and a bunch of plants from a hike he'd gone on in Glen Canyon in San Francisco. And I could tell from these informational imprints that you know, even though my first impression was kind of right, like Scott does like to talk a lot, my emotional read was totally wrong. Um, I'd kind of written him off, but in the information I could see that Scott was like me. He wasn't just talking about weird bugs and plants, like he, he really cared about them. He cared enough to slow down 60 plus times on his hike in Glen Canyon and take a picture of them. So it was this encoding and sharing of his behavior that let me see something that I failed to see in person. I failed to see it in conversation, that Scott and I share a fundamental kinship over our love of other organisms. INAT served as kind of a prosthesis for my underdeveloped social skills. It was that trust that led me to start working with Scott, and it's why, what's kept us working together for 13 years now. And I'll be honest, he still kind of annoys the hell out of me a lot of the time. <laughs> Um, but, you know, when he's like two minutes into a monologue, I know that, like me, he'd, he'd probably prefer to be looking at a newt. <laughs> All right, second story. Um, one day in the middle of the pandemic, remember that? We received an email at INAT from a South African botanist informing us that police in the Cape region had detained a poacher with a bag full of succulent plants and a phone full of videos he'd sent to potential buyers overseas, explaining that he'd found the plants using loca location information from iNaturalist. The plants in question were in the genus Conophytum. I don't know if anyone's a giant succulent collector here, but um, they're called cone plants, and they're really cool. They're like these um, 
upside down candy corns that like grow out of the soil and they've got this like giant flower that's bigger than a plant and they're super cute. Uh, and to some people, they're so cute that they will pay a lot of money for them and there is a global black market in the distribution of these plants and other succulents. So this botanist was writing to tell us that while the pandemic lockdowns had totally shut down uh, poachers coming into South Africa to poach these plants, they had unlocked this new world of, of potential poachers using the internet to communicate with locals in South Africa to convince them to poach the plants. And if you're an internet native and you need information about where these plants are, or any plant is, um, where are you gonna go? Dad us. Uh, so we've been aware of this threat pretty much since the beginning, and it's why we obscured the coordinates of observations of organisms that we know to be threatened. Uh, but those of you who study information security know partial security, where you reveal a part of the truth, but not the whole truth, is particularly difficult. And the stakes in South Africa are especially dire. Some species are known from only like one or two patches, like the size of a kitchen table. So a dedicated person with a shovel could literally drive a species to extinction in under an hour's work. And if that person found that population using data from iNaturalist, I would be complicit in that extinction. That's pretty much the exact opposite of the moral outcome I was hoping to achieve with iNaturalist. I wanted people, and I want people, to pay attention to other organisms. I want people to care so much about other life on Earth that they don't destroy it, and that they feel enough kinship with slugs and birds and tiny, weird desert plants with giant flowers that they want to help them thrive and keep them alive forever. So, naturally, I find this email pretty disturbing, but it's complicated. If INAT helps a million people value other organisms for themselves and not for how much they can sell them for, is it worth the extinction of, of one species? If not, is there an acceptable trade-off? Maybe 10 million people benefiting for the extinction of one species? People describe new species using iNaturalist data all the time. Um, you know, they see a photo of something and they're like, that's not a thing, and I'm the expert in that thing. Um, so it happens pretty frequently. So if INET helps humanity understand and describe 100 new species in the time it helps to facilitate the destruction of one, is that an acceptable trade-off? It's also worth pointing out that poaching is a vanishingly small threat to biodiversity next to the destruction of land for human use. Uh, so is it defensible for us to facilitate some collateral poaching if we can combat habitat loss by showing people what we lose each time we set up a lithium mine or a solar farm? By helping them to see creatures as peers and not acceptable collateral, da collateral damage? My opinions on this shift from day to day, but oftentimes it's hard to, hard to see the extinction of a species as really worth it. To get back to South Africa, we worked with our colleagues there to ensure records of all conophytum species were obscured, as well as other rare succulents in the country, and we've not heard of any of them going extinct on our watch, so yay. Um, and we're not even convinced that, that poacher really got their data from my naturalist. But the point is that their that threat is real, not just for succulent plants, but for all kinds of different organisms all around the world. Bonus, a paper was just published a few weeks ago asserting that the obscuration that we apply to coordinates to protect those rare species actually leads to bad science when presumably bad scientists ignore the precision metadata that we attach to such records and base their analyses on intentionally incorrect information. So I don't know, maybe we are the baddies. All right, last anecdote, it's a bit of a mishmash. Um, I don't know if I just live in a hole, I mean, I guess I, I know I live in a hole, uh, but in the last year I feel like INET has become relatively pervasive in the biological and natural history circles that I, that I run in, in kind of weird ways. Uh, I was on a lichen walk earlier this year, and yes, people go on lichen walks intentionally to look at lichens, um, and I was shocked to be uh, not the youngest attendee Usually, like, I'm 42 years old, I'm usually the youngest person on a lichen walk by, like, 20 years. Uh, and there were all these people who were younger than me, and I was like, whoa, what's, what's that about? And they were all talking about, you know, observing things, and whether their observations would be research grade, and whether they should trust the identification of the algorithm, all of which are, like, pieces of INAT jargon. 
and it was just a bit surreal <laughs> to know that all these people were, that it had become that interwoven in kind of their personal practice. And just a few weeks ago, I was in the field with some entomologists, people who study insects, and in their downtime, when they weren't outside, you know, waving a net around and catching butterflies, they had INAT open on their laptops, and they were using it to share their findings from the day in real time with their colleagues, um, or to identify plants. So all these bug people were like super world experts in bugs, but they weren't so world expert in plants, so they were using INAT to help them out with the plants. And it felt a bit weird <laughs> and kind of intimidating, you know, rewarding that people are using my work in a way that I hope that they would. Um, but also knowing all my biases that are sort of infiltrated into the platform, it's a little bit unsettling. But where I wanted to end was uh, earlier this year, I was working on a reboot of our mobile app, and I was really, really regretting the decision to abandon 10 years of legacy code to uh, build a new app in like a year. <laughs> and nothing was working right, and uh, something was broken with fetching the GPS coordinates, and it would cause you to lose all your data, and it was really lame. And I was, you know, I'm sure all you MIM students can commiserate, because you probably were going through this like two weeks ago, right? <laughs> um, and yeah, I was just sick of things failing. I felt like that person. Um, I was sick of things failing, and uh, sick of looking at a screen, and frankly, sick of helping people learn about nature. Uh, so I did my best to add a little bit more logging to the app, and I loaded a test copy on my phone, and I jumped on the bus, and I went to the local cl closest park to me that feels a little bit wild, which is called Diamond Canyon in Oakland. And I was like, cool, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna test the app, and I'll get some log data, and I'm gonna figure this out. And Diamond Canyon is an interesting spot if you haven't been there. It's a park, it's very green, it's beautiful, but it's also just riddled with invasive plants. It has a really complicated history of redwood logging and damming and channelization. And someone had the dumb idea to put a driving range in there. Anyway, <laughs> drives me a bit nuts. Um, but, you know, I jumped off the bus, I stepped into the park, and took a deep breath and filled my lungs with that awesome smell and feel of like wet forest air and heard the creek babbling. And I felt instantly a lot better. And I walked up the trail a little bit, and I noticed these liverworts, which are these little flat plants underneath the ivy. And I was like super excited. I was like, oh my god, liverworts. Um, and I immediately like closed the test version of the app that I had that was broken and like opened the version of the app that did work, the old version. And I was like crouched down and taking pictures of these liverworts. And this woman came up behind me with her dog and was like, what you doing there? And I was like, liverworts, like a little bit too crazily. Um, <laughs> I'm like, they're right here, they're on this embankment. And she's like, oh, cool. Uh, those are like mosses, right? And I was like, no, they're not. They're, they're, they're similar. And she's like, nah, I think you're wrong about that. I'm pretty sure they're mosses. <laughs> and I was like, no, no, they used to be both lumped in this group called bryophyta, but these days they're, they're two separate things. Um, plus these things, they form these little scales on the soil and like, check it out. Like, you can, you can just look at it right here. So I step back and she crouched down like I was crouching down and she's looking at these liverworts. And I thought to myself, this is great. Here we are, two perfect strangers, two semi-normal people talking about living things outside in this you know, complicated but also kind of enriching lang uh, landscape. It's both wild and, and not really that wild. And just trying to understand it, trying to understand this complicated cosmopolitan world together without the need for any technological intermediary, no need to encode or, or share our experiences for future discussion or for popularity or for anything. We're just two people in a weird world having a discussion about this wondrous thing. And she stood up and she was like, that's pretty interesting. I'll have to look that up when I get home. Kind of, you know, skeptical. <laughs> um, and she turned to me, this like, kindred stranger on the trail, sharing this experience that humans been, have been having for time immemorial of just seeing a weird thing outside and being like, huh, isn't that cool? And she turned to me and she's like, you are gonna post this to iNaturalist, right? And I was like, yeah. Yeah, I am. Congratulations again to everyone and thank you so much.